How Vena is making over $100,000 a month at just 22 years old by wholesaling real estate. What is up, guys? Zach in here. Welcome to the Bags Riches podcast. And we have an inspirational story today. We have Vena from Washington, and she's going to share exactly how she is crushing it in wholesaling real estate and how you can do the same exact thing. Vena, thank you so much for coming on today. Thanks for having me on, Zach. I'm excited. Awesome. So I know I've seen you on social media. I know you've been doing ROS postcards. You've been doing deals. And honestly, seeing somebody so young uh, get into wholesaling real estate and becoming successful, I got to know your story. I got to know how you got into it. And obviously, we have a lot of young people watching this. So we want to know exactly how they can do the same exact thing. So uh, let's start from the top. I mean, how did you get into wholesaling real estate? Yes, sir. So I started out in real estate as a real estate agent. I skipped college to get my real estate license. Sold a bunch of houses in my first year, sold a bunch of houses in my second year. And then suddenly someone came up to me and they were like, hey, you're prospecting for sellers for listings. You should be going after fixers because you can make so much more on assignment fees. You can only make 3%, 2.5% sometimes as an agent, but on assignment fees, you can make way more. So you should switch. So I just started doing that. And pretty simply, I switched from being an agent to a wholesaler because I got my first deal within like three months of wholesaling just by cold calling sellers. That's how I started out. And then I started putting money into marketing and things like that. So I scaled it up. But pretty simply, I went from an agent to wholesaler. And once I started getting those wholesale checks, I did not look back. So I still do agent deals, but mostly most of my business is wholesale now. Yeah. And that's kind of what I want to get into because you're so young at this, right? And I, you know, I, I started at 17, right? So like I, I mm -hmm. get being young, but doing it from another part in the country, you know, I think that's something a lot of other people can relate to too. And obviously I, I was a 17 year old, you know, kid in high school, uh, yeah. but you're also a woman on here. And I've always said like, if you can learn as a woman, how to get really good in acquisitions, you do better than any guy. Uh, there's a couple of, you know, women in there are perks. They, they are, perks. There are a lot of perks, but <laughs> There's also a lot of challenges and that's something I kind of want to bring up because I can't relate to that experience, right? But I know you can and so many people, we got so many great women uh, watching this too. So we want to talk about that too. So let's talk about your first wholesaling deal. How old okay. were you? Where was it going? How much did you make? Uh, explain the whole thing. So my first wholesale deal was 2021. I was 20 years old at the time. Uh, it was from a cold call. I cold called this lady and she was selling her house in Kent, Washington, King County. And she was like, I want 360 for this. Um, so we went over there. I brought a mentor. We looked at the house, figured out the rehab number, blah, blah, blah. We put under contract for 360 that day. It was, we went to the appointment and then we emailed her the contract and then she signed it that day for 360. And then I went to my Facebook groups and I've started selling it for three, 400, I think. I started selling it for 400. And this one was super interesting because for my first deal too, I had like 80 comments of people interested in this deal because this was like pandemic market was super hot. Everybody wanted deals. So I got all these um, inquiries. I showed it to like six people in a day and I had someone who wanted to buy it for the asking price. And so I started talking to the other people who were scheduled. You know, I was ready to just sell it to the first person to give me the earnest money and sign my assignment contract. So I started calling the other people to cancel their showings. And I called this lady and she was like, um, you know, and she was an agent who had a buyer for the deal. And agents were already used to there being 20 and 30 offers on houses at the time, right? Pandemic, super competitive market. And so I called her and I was like, hey, I, we have located a buyer for this. We're canceling all the other showings there. They offered asking. And she goes, oh, well, we were off. We were thinking about offering 420 or 440. And I had this for 360. So I was like, really? <laughs> So, um, of course, I, I hadn't promised it to that buyer yet. So I showed it to this girl and her buyer or this agent and her buyer and they liked it. And they, we ended up selling it to them for 440 and it was a pretty big assignment fee, $80,000. So we didn't want, I think for the purposes of their hard money, we didn't want to, um, try to do a huge fee like that through escrow. So we actually did double close it. Um, my mentor had a really good relationship with the hard money company. So we double closed it for zero down and flipped it in about a week. So we made $80,000 minus the selling fees, wow. which was a lot more than we would have made by just normally assigning it. So while it was pretty complicated, it was worth it in the end. And then we just split the profit 50-50. That's beautiful. I mean, I, 
I kind of had a mentor, you know, my dad starting out, kind of helped me out. I mean, he, he wasn't really that much of a help. Like, I mean, he helped me learn I it, get that. Like, I, I did the whole process, but if definitely having him there to sign the contract for me at 17 was good for me, but like, right. <laughs> I, I think you probably would have ended up just by yourself doing it, probably not making the same amount, but still amazing. So that's kind of cool in the yeah. similar story there. But you know, one thing about your markets that's always interesting to me is how high the ARV is, right? Because yeah. I had deals, ARV is like 150, 100. And I'm making I know. money on it. But then the 360, 400 is tough. Um, so you started wholesaling from there. What was that journey after that first deal? Like, I mean, that's a lot of money for yeah. a young person. So how do you keep yeah, going? That was, it was pretty sweet. Um, after that is when I took all that money, or not all of it, but I put most of it back into marketing and then back into hiring cold callers. Mm. So um, I just, scaled up. I mean, I started putting like 10,000 bucks a month into postcards and making that work on that side. And after that, I probably did like three more deals in the next month or two. And probably my first six months of wholesaling was like a hundred grand. Wow. That's like net. That's beautiful. I, I love to see that. And so you, you went into postcards and obviously it's, it's kind of scary getting into that, right? Like, so was it scary for you to just spend that initial ad spend on that for the postcard? Cause I, a lot of people get a little scared for that. It was pretty hefty in the beginning. I was started out like between four and 7,000 bucks a month, which was still a lot, but that mentor actually told me about the ROS and he got, that's the one that he had been using for like months, maybe a couple of years. So I knew it worked and I've seen it, the proof of concept, but it was still a lot of money going out. Um, but luckily I did like, two or three deals in the first couple months of postcards. So that kind of proved to me that they work and I wasn't scared to send out postcards after that. Wow. And did you like go through mailing mastery at all for the ROS or you just kind of what he was doing? No, I just uploaded a list. Yeah. That's great. That's great. <laughs> only people, you know, so FYI, we, me and Rick, we kind of created the ROS postcard right. uh, with open letter and we gave, we made a, cre a full like $10,000 course that for free for anyone that did it. And like, no one even does it. They just, they just shoot off the hip and they do well with it. But it's just, it's kind of funny, but oh, yeah, our funny. postcard, check out open letter. It's great. Uh, mm -hmm. So you're in a high air of market and you're doing wholesaling okay. deals. So tell me what's the secret for it? Because I know so many people in Washington that they'll, I get DMS every day. Oh, it's too high price. Everyone wants a million dollars. What are your thoughts on that? And how do you actually succeed when everyone's saying that? So yeah, Washington's pretty a high price in general. The average price in Seattle is like 800, but really it's all a million bucks plus. Um, and it is fairly saturated. I mean, there's a lot of people doing a lot of deals. You definitely, to be a full-time wholesaler, you can't just stay like in Seattle or in Bellevue. You have to go into the other markets to do a lot of deals. There's only so many good deals in Seattle in a month or a year. Um, I mean, the juice is all there though. Like these deals are juicy and the special play right now in Seattle is building detached units and attached units because you can actually condoize and separate out the tax ID parcels without subdividing. And so we buy a house for 500. Like the one I bought, I built, I bought it for 500. I'm going to build a unit in the back for 300, but it's going to be worth 600 when it's done in like 10 months. Wow. So there's 300 grand in equity on that lot, not even including rehabbing the main house. So there are, there's crazy profit dollars to be made. I'm wholesaling one right now where you can add two detached units on the property. Well, actually one attached and one detached. But at the end of the day, I'm selling this for $695. I've got under contract for $650. And um, ARV on the main house is about $900. The finished value for the whole property after building two units is $2.1 million. So very high ARV. Um, but they're buying it for 700. And so after building everything, there's like five or 600 grand in profit to be made on this. So when you know how to read the zoning codes and you know, which properties are valuable, you can make really big fees in Seattle. Oh, but yeah. again, like you can go to the surrounding areas. The mid range of our market is like four to 500 and that's a really good sweet spot. There's a big flipper demand in these mid range. So we make my average fee is $40,000 here in Seattle. Yeah. I mean, that's pretty similar to mine, but I mean, average ARV is like 350, 360, but it's mm -hmm. mostly volume and stuff like that. So that's cool in that part. You know, you're, so you're marketing right now, like as of today, cause you're, you're making yep. a lot per month. Is it just postcards? Like what are the type of marketing you're doing? So I do postcards. I have a team that cold calls. I've got about five people who are cold calling for three hours a day. And then I do a lot of JV business. I get a lot of people bringing me deals from social media. 
And I'm about to start doing some wholesaler events here in the office, training people to bring me deals. Wow. That is my next move. But those are my, I'm trying to think if I have anything else. Oh, I go door knocking every once in a while, especially if I've got a deal, I'll go door knock around it myself and see if anybody else in the area is selling. But uh, that's the bulk of it. Okay. And so if I'm looking at like a pie of your wholesaling business mm -hmm. and of the deals you're getting, what percentage are you saying is from postcards versus cold calling and door knocking and JV? For this year, I'm looking at about 25% from mail, about 50%. Well, I really would say the other 75% is split between referral JV and my wow. cold caller team. Jeez, that's that's insane. It's it's different different from mine because most of mine's just direct mail. Uh, so that, mm -hmm. that's fascinating looking on that. So just the cold calling is going well. What, what list are you going after for cold calling? Just the stress property list. We really don't go too hard in the paint on criteria. Um, we do high equity owner. We do absentee owner. It's mostly just people who've owned their property for more than twenty years. Okay, uh, for more than twenty. Yes, more than twenty years. Wow. Okay. And, Are you guys going less? You know, we go like three or four or five. Um, wow. But, I mean, we, we do a, a wide angle of it. So you're doing 20 plus. Are you using just a data provider for this? Yep. We use Property Radar. Property Radar. Okay, perfect. And then uh, what's skip tracing? Uh, property Radar. Wow. Okay. Mm -hmm. Hey, it's working. It's working, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so you got the VAs running there. You're doing well. So let's kind of transfer over to acquisitions. Let's say we got a good lead from direct mail or cold calling or whatever, how does that process work to get put into acquisitions? Yeah, so for the most part, I'm doing a lot of the legwork and then I have one admin person who helps me with that, like back end contracts and stuff. But the way my team works is I've got people cold calling and I kind of give them a, a lot of the responsibility on closing. So if they need my help, I'll go to the appointment with them, but um, they'll do the appointment, they'll put under contract and then I come into play a lot more on the selling side. Okay. So yeah, that's how, that's how we run it. So are you basically closing the deals yourself? Mm -hmm. Ah, perfect. And are these in-person virtual appointments? How are you closing these? In person, in person yeah. mostly. That's how I know you're making a lot of money for a deal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know when, I mean, we've got big deals here in Seattle. I'm not going to just, you know, leave them to chance. I'm going to go close them myself. <laughs> I get it. So what's your script? So you're talking to a seller. Hey, I want to sell my house. How for a lot of beginners out here, it's hard to determine, Hey, is this uh, a deal? Is this someone that's kind of, you know, they're, they're talking it, but they're kind of like, they don't want to do a deal. Like what, what's your veteran experience of like, Hey, this should be a deal. I should go on or I shouldn't. So figuring out whether I should uh, put effort into the deal. Yeah. I mean, everyone says they want to mm -hmm. sell, but then it, it's a, it's kind of a unconscious thing. Us like people yeah. that know how to do deals is like, this is a deal or not, but like kind of putting pen to paper. How do you figure that out? I do my best to pre-qualify over the phone. I'm very rarely going out of my way and talk to like, go to a seller's house and talk with them if they're not motivated to sell. Yeah. So I ask a lot of questions. We'll have like 10 or 20 minute phone conversations before I go out to their house because you know, it's just as fair to them as it is to me that, where I'm only going out there if it's something that's really worth going after. So um, I'll ask some questions, you know, like, where are you going? Have you talked to agents about your house? Have you showed it to other investors? What is your ideal outcome here? What happens if you don't sell? I ask a pretty hefty list of questions to make sure that I'm not wasting my time because we only have so many hours in a day. And yeah. then I also train my team pretty heavily on pre-qualifying them over the phone, both on the first contact and before the appointment. Okay. And so if you're going to talk to someone who wants to sell, what's your go-to questions for qualifying? My go-to questions are obviously, when do you plan on selling? Where are you going? What's taking you there? Um, I always ask what happens if you don't sell? How much would you like to get for the property? Um, uh, you know, what is your best case scenario? As in, like, are you going to shop my offer to 20 other people? Do you want to mm -hmm. talk to 15 people before you sell this? Or do you want to keep it simple and just go with the first person that you like? I had a really successful appointment like last week where he told us he was pretty transparent, which was kind of, you just get lucky when the seller is not trying to play games with you, which happens a lot with us because they don't know who you are. They don't trust you. They think you're like everybody else. So there definitely is a factor in differentiating yourself, but I'm in this appointment and he goes, yeah, I showed it to someone yesterday. I'm going to show it to someone today after you guys. 
that guy's probably going to come in pretty low. And our strategy was to just let him believe that we would pay his high price and then just come back later and bring him back down to reality. And that did work because this guy started at 750 and then we got him down to 650 the next week. Wow. So in that case, it was really helpful because we were, I would say just leveling with him and building rapport and showing that we care about him getting a lot of money for his house. And in this situation too, sometimes wholesalers go in and they're like, I'm going to buy your property, right? We told them, hey, at your price, we probably can't do it, but we've got a big network of investors that can. And so we can get this done for you. Um, It helps a lot when you are just focusing on your ideal seller, right? And when you kind of put everything else aside, then it becomes pretty easy. Because if you're only looking people who are ready in the next seven days, they're motivated, they know what they want, they don't want to play games, and you're focusing on those people, then you're going to do a lot of deals. Wow. Okay. So that, that's a little different <laughs> my approach. That's why I like talking yeah. to different people. And I want people watching this to understand. Yeah, I give people very strict rules on like doing things, uh, but people, they won't do that and they'll still do well. Like my, my word's not gospel here uh, for it. I mean, it helps the majority of newbies, but like that's an approach I don't do, but hey, it leads you to get deals. So it definitely works. And so let's kind of talk about the acquisition when it comes to actually closing it. Like, What's your closing mm-hmm. line? How do you give that offer out? Because it's it's more about how you say it than what you say. So like, how, how do you do it? So when it comes to closing on price, I usually try to get it out of them first, of course. And I'll say, hey, how much like um, this one I did, because it was actually a pretty successful close on the contract. I said, okay, let's recap. You want to move to Florida. Uh, you want to get there pretty as soon as possible. And you needed how much to get there? And I let him say his price, which was seven fifty. He needs seven fifty, and I go, "Yep, that that is where." Um, I'm trying to remember exactly what I said, but I said something like, "Yep, that's where you might we might have bad news for you because we can't do seven fifty. We're going to be more in the low six hundred. Um, but you know, like I said, really your market value is seven hundred, and so you're familiar with you know the on market process, right? And how you would net about ten percent less because you have to pay realtors and selling costs." And so you would really net like 640 on the market. And we laid out the numbers, we showed them net sheets, showed them comps. And from there, we told him, you know, we, we could sign for 620 and we would buy it at 620. He asked us to do 650. So I said, um, we would need time at 650 to bring in other contractors, see if we can do this project for cheaper, do feasibility with the city for building in the backyard. And we did it, uh, so we signed for 650. And there was a pretty clear expectation that we might come down on price later, which is good because then when we go shopping for buyers, we're going to get the highest offer. If it's, you know, if it's tight, then we're just going to go back and renegotiate for our fee. Okay, perfect. And how much do you think you're going to make on that one? Um, we're sending it out at six ninety five right now. So 45 grand. I love it. You know, I, there's so many people on YouTube. They're like, Hey, I got 15 acquisitions managers and all these things. And see like you're making five or 10 K a deal. Like I, right. that was the last thing I ever got out of the yeah. business from is cause I was making 60, 70, 80 K on these deals. Like I physically don't want to go on there cause my acquisitions people give them for 60 or 50. Uh, until 100%. Like it, it came to the point. So I think a lot of people, you know, it's their, their egos get in the way of like, Oh, you know? Uh, so let's yeah. talk about the, the elephant in the room. You know, I, as a young person, you're a young person. As a beginner, did you have struggles as a 20, 21, 22 year old being young uh, with Absolutely. selling? Are you looking really young? <laughs> right? How do you overcome that? Yeah, so it's it's awesome. When I was 18, I was super shy. I was super introverted. I had just left high school, barely had any friends. So I didn't know anything about sales. Um, and I was going to real estate events. So I was watching these people like regular agents. They were going up, they were selling a hundred houses a year, talking on stage about how they did it and blah, blah, blah. And, um, a big thing that I took away when I was new to sales was that if I keep telling myself that no one's going to buy from me and that I suck and that, you know, me being shy, is it's not going to get me anywhere. Those are all limiting beliefs. Those are all things that can be overcome. It's not impossible for an 18 year old to make 50 grand on a house, Right. So I, I don't know, honestly, I just sat down and I just started eliminating those limiting beliefs. I started practicing objections for when people would tell me that I'm too young to sell their house. And I just focus on learning my market and how to actually sell. I read up on all the Zig Ziglar and the Jim Rohn and everything. And 
I never got that objection. No one has ever told me that I was too wow. young to sell their house. Jeez. So I kind of overprepared for the fact, but if I didn't go through that mental process of like, you know, what am I going to say if someone <laughs> says that to me or, Hey, Vena, let's just try telling ourselves that you're not too young for this. You can do this. You can provide value in your marketplace. And I think that's what, that's what helped me overcome that hump because yes, you're young, but really if you're willing to hustle, there's deals out there to be made. Wow. I, the reason why I asked you that is when I was 17 years old, I was, before I even was on social media, I was tiny, skinny guy. Yep. And I was 17 with a squeaky voice. And of course, <laughs> every appointment, even though I was confident, I got that. I got that question every single time. So I'm telling you, if you're young, it doesn't matter. It's about how you present yourself there. So yes. talking about that on the acquisitions part, and let's talk about, you know, being a woman out here in real estate wholesaling. Has you mm -hmm. Have you found it's a little different uh, <laughs> than how the average YouTuber presents it and how do you overcome those challenges? You know, there's not a lot of women in the wholesaling space. Yeah. There's a lot of women in the realtor space. So yeah. I, there are a lot of strong women at these events that I would go to. And it was very inspiring. Um, women on average do better in real estate sales than men do. Oh, yeah. And I really have largely been mentored by men. So for the most part, it's one, it's another thing, just like being young. It's something that made no sense to let stop me. So, you know, there's obviously, there's really no disadvantage of being a woman. If anything, there's an advantage because we come across softer. We empathize more with sellers, especially in the wholesaling space. There's, that's a big advantage because people are going through delicate situations. So, you know, a man comes into an old lady's house and he's like, oh uh, yeah, I can give you 300 for your house and I need you out in three weeks. Versus me, I come in and I'm like, oh my gosh, why do you have to be out in three weeks? What's going on? You know, what can, what else can I do to help? there's a big difference. So um, I really do like being a woman in the industry. I've never seen it as a disadvantage. And I don't think anyone should see it as a disadvantage. There's like, that's, again, limiting belief. That's number one, it's ridiculous. Number two, you can't let it stop you. Because when you let those things stop you up, why are you getting in your own way? Right? Oh, yeah, exactly. One thing I really like <laughs> you said there, the way you looked at it is it seems subconscious to to you, but it's probably the most important thing I have to teach people, but you show empathy with people, right? Most people show sympathy, not empathy. There's a big difference mm. in sympathy and empathy, right? Mm -hmm. um, especially with probates, tough situations. And I know it's subconscious because you're probably an empathetic person, but like people that show sympathy, it's like, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to hear that versus actually right. like hearing the voice, right? And when you said that, like you actually, like your tone changed. And mm -hmm. I think that's a really small thing uh, people don't know, but it's, it's huge. Um, so I appreciate For you sure. saying that because it's, it's the key difference between dealing with competition and things. And so I, yeah. going on the selling side as a realtor though, how do you mm -hmm. sell those deals? So we're like, I mean, you, I know you're using Facebook groups, but like, how are you getting these deals sold? Uh, so wholesale in general, how am I selling them? Yeah. Yeah. A lot of mine are sold. I've actually sold a lot of deals through my network, like going to wholesaler events. There's, there's a really big investor space here in Seattle. So there's like, four or five events a month where you can just go and meet people and meet buyers. And I really only contract stuff that I could sell really easily, right? I'm not trying mm -hmm. to squeeze pennies out of deals. I'm mostly going for the stuff where I know it's a good deal and I could just sell it to a friend. So um, I've got a buyer's list of like 500 and these are people that I've wow. met in real life and have real relationships with. I know their buy box and they trust me, right? You know, after a while, if you have a buyer's list, if you're sending out shit deals all the time, they're not going to read your emails anymore. So, you know, it's really important to me to keep my re reputation as a wholesaler. Um, but the Facebook groups, the buyer list, I have a couple of people who um, have investor lists. So when I really need something sold, I'll send it over to them and they'll blast it out for me. Um, that way I don't have to pay for it. I'm cheap on that end. And then, um, yeah, that's, that's mostly where my, where my disposition's at. Wow. And so do you personally call these buyers when you got a deal yourself? I have a few right in my back pocket that I'll personally call. Um, but for the most part, it's been email blast. Wow. Okay. And then when they say yes to a deal or something like that, is there a walkthrough going on? Do they just go mm -hmm. themselves? Like how does that process work? I'll walk them through the house. Yep. Wow. Perfect. And then- Pretty uh, simple, you know. Yeah. <laughs> 
when uh, when we're doing forty thousand dollar deals, and that's why I'm friends with a lot of the big wholesalers here in Washington who will do like fifty or a hundred deals in a year in state. And um, I really only need like twenty or thirty at forty thousand dollars a piece to make good money. So, you know, they tell me, Vanny, you need to hire this out, you need to hire this out, but I don't want to be in sales for more than a couple more years. And so, for me, I'm good. Just you know, they're good deals. I can do the work on them. Hey, you're young, you're making a ton of money and you're really inspiring for wholesaling. So mm -hmm. I, I see where you're at right now. And obviously it's, it's kind of funny. I know who you are because on TikTok you're, you're going crazy on that. Right. And <laughs> it's kind of funny. I would never know about your story. Right. And like, there's so many wholesalers. I know in my local market, they're making like 50 K a month and like, no one knows about them. They're just, yeah. they're doing crazy. Right. Silent killers. Uh, so it, it, they're silent. And so that's why I like you going on social media, inspiring more people. And that's kind of how I, I met you there. Mm -hmm. uh, where are you at right now and how are you going to grow? Like what, what's your future looking like to bring the wholesaling business from hundred K a month, even more? Yeah. Um, like I said, I really, I don't need a ton of money out of wholesaling. It's always been just about making money so that I can buy rentals and eventually retire in my twenties, like, you know, reach financial freedom, be able to just do what I want to do. I don't want to hustle and grind 24 hours a day. I'm sorry. You know, people look at wholesaling as a side hustle, as a quick way to make money. And that's how I look at it too. So I really don't have desire to create a huge wholesaling business. If that happens as an effect of me or as a, yeah, as an effect of me scaling up, then that happens and I'll hire people and I'll put them in place. But um, I'm doing these like three and $400,000 equity purchases here in Seattle. And so once I hit my goal on my rentals, maybe I'll have a wholesaling business running itself. Maybe I won't. I'm really just taking it day by day. And um, like I said, it's, it's my hustle. It's how I'm making money to buy investments. And so that's kind of, I really want to scale up on the influencer side. So that's kind of where I see myself in the next few years. Hey, it's made me a ton of money. So I, I think you're doing yeah. the same thing. So uh, <laughs> I love your story. Most importantly, I like actually how you share the story. You show what works, what doesn't, all these things. Uh, so if somebody wants to kind of listen on your story and kind of follow you on there, I think it's really inspirational. Um, how can they reach out to you? What social medias do you have and everything like mm -hmm. that? I'm on everything. Check me out on YouTube. I do a lot of good long form stuff on everything I'm doing. I do vlogs and my story and all that. Do a lot of Instagram, a lot of TikTok. Um, those are probably the two where you can find me the most. Perfect. Uh, Vena, thank you so much for hopping on. Do you have any parting thoughts for the audience right now? Uh, before we head off, go hustle hard. You know, I think the biggest thing for new wholesalers and probably new salespeople in general is these limiting beliefs. And it's all just BS, you know, like yeah. why can like a Zach Ginn or a Vena or whoever do all these deals? Why can we, but why can't you? There's, there's no reason. There's no degree of separation. If we can do it, you can do it. <laughs> I love it. Vena, thank you so much for hopping on and uh, make sure you go subscribe to this channel. Go check out her channel and uh, like the video. Thanks, guys. Woo, thank you.